Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Christopher Wright DeRocher, and I serve as uh, Director of Policy Development and Programming uh, with the American Constitution Society. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Um, I'd like to thank also our panelists for being here, and I'd like to extend a special thanks to Senator Whitehouse and his staff for all their help in making this event possible. For those of you who may not know, ACS is a national network of progressive lawyers, judges, policymakers, scholars, and law students who believe that the law should be a force to improve the lives of all people. ACS works for positive change by shaping debate on vitally important legal and constitutional questions, such as the proper use and limits of executive clemency. This past July, there were reports that President Trump had asked his advisors about his power to pardon aides, family members, and even himself in connection with special counsel, counsel Robert Mueller's investigation into the Trump campaign's connection with Russia. By the end of the summer, the president had granted his very first pardon to former Sheriff Joe Arpaio after he was convicted of criminal contempt for flagrantly disregarding a court order in a racial profiling case. This pardon raised eyebrows for being what some considered a nakedly political favor to a longtime Trump ally for circumventing any type of evaluation by the Office of Pardon Attorney within the Department of Justice and for coming so soon after O'Pyre's conviction and before his sentence. For better or for worse, Trump has yet again distinguished himself through his anomalous behavior. He is just the third president in the last 40 years to use his pardon power during the first nine months of his term. So what does Arpaio's pardon portend for the president's future use of executive clemency? And what, if any, limits are there to his authority? Is there such a thing as an improper use of the pardon power? And if so, who has the authority to intervene? Leading the discussion to help us answer these and other pressing questions is our moderator for today's discussion and a friend to ACS, Kimberly Atkins. Kim is the chief Washington reporter and columnist for the Boston Herald, where she covers the White House, Congress, and the U.S. Supreme Court. She also guest hosts C-SPAN's morning call-in show, Washington Journal, interviewing lawmakers, public policy experts, and journalists. Before her uh, career as a journalist, Kim was a litigation attorney in Boston. She's a graduate of Wayne State University, Boston University School of Law, and College of Communications, and the Columbia University Graduate School of Journalism. As you can see, she is an ideal facilitator for this conversation. So now let me turn it over to Kim to introduce the rest of our panel. Thanks. And thank you all for joining us today for what uh, will be a very interesting discussion about executive clemency. I myself are excited for uh, our panel uh, of esteemed experts to get started on this discussion. So I'm going to give a very brief introduction of everyone. I uh, encourage you all to look in your materials and watch uh, their full, uh, check out their full bios. It would take half the uh, program for me to talk about all their accolades, so I'll do this pretty quickly. Uh, first, uh, we'll start with uh, Martin Reddish. Uh, was right next to me. He's a professor of law and public policy at Northwestern University Pritzker School of Law, uh, where his scholarship focuses on, among other things, judicial independence. And in addition, he is senior counsel at the law firm of Sidley Austin LLP. Margaret Colgate Love uh, is a principal at the law office of Margaret Love, and she's a former United States pardon attorney, uh, now in private practice, specializing in, among other things, executive clemency and the restoration of rights. Next, we have Renato Mariotti. He's a partner at Thompson Colburn LLP, and he's a former federal prosecutor in the United States uh, Attorney's Office in Chicago, where he has prosecuted numerous cases, including federal obstruction of justice cases. And finally, we have Andrew Wright. He's an associate professor at Savannah Law School, and he previously served in the White House as associate counsel to President Barack Obama and also previously as an assistant counsel to Vice President Al Gore in the Clinton White House. Thank you all for joining us today for this discussion. Now, as Christopher pointed out, this uh, discussion is framed uh, in terms of President Trump's first pardon, which is of former Maricopa County, Arizona Sheriff Joe Arpaio, who was pardoned uh, for uh, uh, failing to adhere to a court order to stop racial profiling. The pardon was unusual in a lot of ways. It was unusual in that it came even before he was sentenced. 
uh, it was unusual in that the president did it without consulting attorneys at the Justice Department. It's not a constitutional requirement, but uh, that is normal procedure uh, when it comes to pardons. And it sort of set a, a precedent for this administration about what, how the pardon powers will be used. Uh, I just want to read a quote from the president about that pardon. He said, Sheriff Joe is a patriot. Sheriff Joe loves our country. Sheriff Joe protected our borders. And Sheriff Joe was, a, was very, very unfairly treated. So I want to start out this, uh, our discussion with Marty. And I want to ask you about uh, the constitutional basis of these uh, of the presidential pardon power, and whether what we from what we've seen from the president's pardon of Sheriff Arpaio, uh, if it is consistent with those constitutional with that constitutional foundation, and what the founders intended when they created this pa uh, pardon power. And I would just say, everybody, remember to press talk when you're talking, and uh, click it back off when you're done. Thanks, Kim. Uh, well, the pardon power in Article Two is extremely broad. There is only one narrow exception, and that applies to impeachment. So if one is to be a pure textualist, one would say the pardon power is unlimited. But anything in the body of the Constitution is limited by the amendments to the Constitution to the extent the two are inconsistent. And my position is that the Arpaio pardon is, a, as a constitutional matter, pathological far beyond the traditional pardon. The, people say to me, well, how could it be worse than pardoning a murderer or a rapist or something like that? It's on a different level because this undermines the basic framework of our constitutional system. Our constitution is counter-majoritarian. It imposes limits on the majoritarian branches of government. And as John Marshall says in Marbury versus Madison, paraphrasing Alexander Hamilton in, in Federalist 78, if the very majoritarian branches who are limited by the Constitution get the final say as to the meaning of those limits, the limits are meaningless. So the idea of an independent judiciary, a judiciary prophylactically insulated against political pressures, uh, is essential to the effective enforcement of a counter-majoritarian constitutional system. You can look at the constitutions of numerous totalitarian societies throughout history, and you can see on paper the constitution is highly protective of individual rights. <clears throat> Excuse me. But because there is no independent judiciary, then those rights go unprotected. So the idea of the judiciary as the ultimate protector of constitutional rights, all of which come in the Bill of Rights and subsequent amendments uh, post-original uh, constitutional document, uh, the need to be able to exercise the authority to enforce those rights. The way they enforce those rights primarily is through the use of an injunction an order that says, stop this or else. And the or else is a prison sentence, a fine, or, or both. If the president can undermine the injunctive power by removing the threat of criminal contempt as a deterrent to violating the injunction, then the court's power to effectively enforce the constitutional rights embodied in the Bill of Rights and the 14th Amendment is lost. The, the message sent by the Arpaio pardon to other sheriffs, other governmental officers is, you don't have to worry about ignoring a, a federal court injunction because as long as you're, what you're doing is consistent with what this president wants, he's going to pardon you. And that is a means of circumventing the constitutional limits imposed by the Due Process Clause of the Fifth Amendment. The Due Process Clause says that you have to have a neutral adjudicator protect your constitutional rights. And what the president is doing is circumventing that power. So as, as broad as the pardon power itself is on its face, it is limited by the Bill of Rights. And that renders the pardon power in this 
particular context unconstitutional. And a number of briefs that were submitted in front of Judge Bolton arguing this, she felt that uh, she couldn't accept that position in light of some precedents, which I thought we had adequately distinguished. And now the case is going up to the Ninth Circuit because Arpaio is, is a, a, a appealing her refusal to vacate it. And uh, we're filing amicus briefs arguing uh, this constitutional point to, to continue the debate. Okay, uh, and Andy, you know, presidents have, uh, presidents in recent years have used the pardon power less often than they used to, uh, despite what we hear uh, about these high profile cases. Uh, do you think that this is a, a good thing? I mean, in, in terms of the idea that people should pay for the crimes that they're convicted of, or is it a problem? Uh, is it a, a, a system of, a tool of justice administration that's going underutilized? I would say the top line is it's being underutilized. And I think I'd like to see a much more robust use of clemency um, and pardon power by presidents. I think when the founders um, granted this power, I think they expected it to be used more frequently um, as a, something that would correct uh, the situation when a, gener you know, a, a legislature passes laws of general applicability and they have, you know, try to figure out ahead of time what kind of conduct should be covered. And then we deal with particular facts and circumstances in cases based on you know, these sort of dispensation of mercy moments. Maybe it's that someone doesn't get charged. Maybe it's that a prosecutor doesn't bring the case. Maybe it's at sentencing, jury nullification, something else. But I think they expected a, you know, a robust use of clemency power. When I teach Dudley and Stevens, you know, which is the case about the seaman who ate the young crew member and get held that it wasn't an excuse to their homicide charge, they got their sentence commuted to six months at a time when all felonies were punishable by death. And I think that, you know, that was kind of the expectation that would be used in our system, and it isn't. I think getting more recent, the crime politics of the 1970s and 80s, um, the backlash to the civil rights movement in Vietnam, et cetera, led to um, a real reticence uh, on the executive's part to use the power more robustly. And you know, a classic example is the Willie Horton ad in the 1988 presidential race, which started in the primaries as an attack against Michael Dukakis's candidacy, but then was used famously by independent groups in the general election against him on behalf of President, future President Bush. And you know, that was a recidivism case. It was also racially tinged. Um, but it was the kind of thing that showed the downside political risk of granting clemency that I think was quite instructive to future presidents to abuse it very sparingly. The last thing I would just say is the country is much, much larger than it was contemplated at the founding as well, and I think, and more complicated. And the fact that the pardon power resides in one person, um, even with the able assistance of the Department of Justice, although query whether or not that's the right place for it to be housed given its pro-prosecution culture, um, I think makes it much harder to get that nav process navigated and get on the president's desk. So I think it's being quite underutilized um, and should be used more robustly, but I certainly would at some point later in the discussion like to talk about why I think the Arpaio pardon was uh, unconscionable. So. Certainly, and we will get there. Um, Margaret, is a one purpose of the president's uh, clemency power to give relief to ordinary people? And if so, is it, is it serving that purpose? Uh, <clears throat> well, um, yes, the answer um, is that it definitely was intended to give relief to anyone who was um, unjustly prosecuted, who was unjustly uh, punished, um, whose punishment was too severe. And historically, I think what many people don't realize is that from the very beginning, um, the pardon power was used very routinely and regularly, um, hundreds of pardons, sentence commutations every year. Um, and it's easy. The, uh, record of this is available on the website of the pardon attorney, at least from um, the administration of Grover Cleveland on, or McKinley, I guess. 
Um, and you can see um, how there were hundreds of grants to ordinary people. There were also uh, uh, grants that I'd categorize as more political, more controversial, colorful. Um, but it's a pretty interesting history. Um, I do want to just make one comment about um, this president's use of his power in the first nine months. Um, again, if you look at the statistics, I think you'll see that until quite recently, uh, probably Ronald Reagan's term, um, the, the president started using his power very soon, uh, usually in the first year, and used it in a very regular way, um, regular in the sense that there were probably uh, 30 to 40 pardons granted every month. And um, even Reagan himself uh, granted two pardons that are uh, interestingly very similar to the Arpaio pardon uh, about uh, a month and a half after he took office. And that was to the two FBI officials, Mark Felt and Edward Miller, uh, who had authorized illegal black bag jobs of uh, of the weathermen, and uh, President Reagan pardoned them. He had said he would pardon them during the campaign, and he pardoned them right out from under the Justice Department that was then prosecuting their appeals. Um, so um, there is historical precedent, uh, even though it was not a criminal contempt case. Uh, and let me just, a uh, final comment about what Marty said about the independence of the judiciary. I would agree with him if this were a civil contempt case, um, if this was interfering with the power of the judiciary to enforce its own orders. Uh, this was a criminal contempt. This was a criminal prosecution and a final judgment uh, in a criminal case. So I think it's a little different uh, than it if, if it had been a civil contempt case. Okay, and Renato, I was going to sort of build up to this question uh, during our discussion, but I figure, you know, why don't we just get right to it, because I know a lot of people want to discuss this, um, about the limits of uh, the presidential pardon power, including can the president pardon his cabinet members, his family, himself? All right, so this is a subject that I've written about, uh, and I think it's a something that I want to preface by saying that I don't have, I'm not some oracle uh, who can give you the quote uh, right answer like I have uh, have some communion with the founding, f the founders of the country or anything like that. Um, as uh, the professor noted, the, power, the pardon power in the Constitution is extremely broad, the way it's written. And these questions have never come up before. I mean, I, honestly, until I read news reports uh, where it said the president of the United States, Donald Trump, is considering whether to pardon himself, I, I honestly, the thought had never crossed my mind that a president would consider pardoning himself. Um, it turns out that it had been considered before uh, by Richard Nixon, and there is a opinion by the OLC, the Office of Legal Counsel, which for those of you who don't know, is the part of the Justice Department that is full of brainiacs who consider very uh, esoteric legal questions uh, and render them on behalf of the executive branch, in which they considered whether the president could pardon themselves. And the OLC at that time, the Office of Legal Counsel, determined that President Nixon could not pardon himself. And the what was cited there was sort of the what I'll call the old maxim, the old sort of legal principle that someone cannot be the judge in their own case, and that's essentially what it would do. I think if you were a textualist, in other words, the, the sort of person who tries to, you know, if you're looking at the text and trying to dissect the text of the Constitution itself, I think a, a better argument might be that the pardon, you know, presupposes that you are pardoning another person. Uh, it's sort of the the the, um, the grant of the pardon power is to pardon someone else. Um, you know, it, it, the idea that you're pardoning yourself um, is sort of a not um, is is sort of antithetical to what the that clause of the Constitution uh, provides. But I, I, as a practical matter, because I think what people are most interested when when I give legal advice, whether it's on television or Twitter or anywhere else, uh, or legal, I say they're not legal advice, but legal commentary and legal analysis, because I don't want to get myself in trouble here. Um, legal commentary and analysis, people are interested in the practical reality. And here's what, what, what I would say. I don't believe, personally, that a court would give the president or anyone else, because this is something governors could potentially do as well, the power to commit illegal acts and then 
essentially give themselves a get-out-of-jail-free card for those illegal acts. You could imagine a president taking bribes and then pardoning himself. You can imagine you know, uh, people conspiring to, to commit a crime. For example, let's say a governor can, can conspire to commit murder and then you know, pardon him or herself. That's obviously, uh, you, know, you could say oh, these are far-fetched examples, but they're the sort of examples that if I was a judge and I was thinking about whether or not the, the pardon power extended to a president, I would think about. Um, just as to the president's family, cabinet members, et cetera, do, do I, if, I, if I still have time to get to these questions. Um, first of all, let me just say that there are strategic reasons why the president will have to be careful about making those pardons, okay? As soon as the president decides to pardon a family member, let's say the president decides, I'm going to pardon Donald Trump Jr., which he could do prospectively. Presidents have done that before. They pardon people before they're even prosecuted. Jimmy Carter famously pro pardoned everyone uh, who had not, you know, had dodged the draft, for example, even before there was any pro necessarily a prosecution of those people. Um, if, he did pro if he did pardon Donald Trump Jr., Donald Trump Jr. would no longer be able to take the fifth. That may matter to the president, that may not, but that typically in a, in a criminal case, you know, if, if, the, if somebody is released from their Fifth Amendment uh, ability not to testify, that can open them up to more questions. You could imagine an absurd uh, example where, for example, the president pardons someone, they no longer can take the fifth, they testify potentially, let's say, falsely, uh, and, they, um, and they commit perjury and they're prosecuted for that, and then the president has to pardon them for committing perjury, and you have an endless loop. Uh, or, for example, the person refusing to testify when they don't, they can't invoke the fifth, and they are held, they're held in contempt. The president, you know, let's say criminal contempt, the president um, pardons that, and then they are, there's an endless loop there. In, in, a situation, a, in a situation where the president is so obviously interfering in an, in, an, in an investigation, I think it raises this very interesting hypothetical of whether or not the pardon power can, you know, if it is itself an act of obstruction as part of a, a scheme to obstruct justice, whether or not that is something that the president can do constitutionally. And the, the short answer is, I don't know. Courts have never considered it before, as far as I'm aware. Um, but it obviously is going to raise serious issues. And I think we all have to hope as a country that if that fact pat pattern developed, that we would not have to rely on the courts because our political branches of government here, you know, we're in the Dirksen Senate office building. Hopefully, the legislative branch of government would take action to put a stop to uh, that behavior. Okay, and so now I would like to open up the discussion a little. Oh, yeah, we were going to open up. We'll start with um, we'll start with Marty, but um, open up the discussion a little bit. You guys can feel free to ask questions of each other and to jump in to this conversation. I'm going to let Marty start off. Okay, uh, two points. One in response to Margaret. Uh, for purposes of judicial independence, I don't really see the the viability of a distinction between civil and criminal contempt. Uh, criminal contempt is for past violations. Civil contempt is sort of a clumsy device because it really only uh, works in the future. It basically says to uh, the, the defendant, you have the keys to the jail in, in your pocket. Uh, if you want to comply, then we will not, no longer punish you. The only thing that will deter immediate violations, like Arpaio's, is the danger of criminal contempt. And if you take that away, then until the civil contempt citation is obtained, there is no disincentive to, uh, on the part of, of the defendant to, to violate uh, the, the injunction. So all those people whose constitutional rights he can violate during that period, there's no protection that the courts can effectively give against that. Um, as to the uh, issue Renato was raising about uh, whether the president can pardon himself, the theory that a man cannot be a judge in his own case is really taken out of context here. That, that's from Lord Cook in, in uh, Dr. Bonham's case, and it's about the meaning of due process, that you have to have a neutral adjudicator that one side of an argument can't be the adjudicator. That's really got nothing to do with the pardon power. And as I read the pardon power, I see no basis for suggesting that the president can't pardon himself. All the arguments I've heard to support that amount to constitutional wishful thinking. Doesn't mean I like that, I, I just work here. Um, I didn't write it. But as you look at it, they list a specific exception, the exception for impeachment. 
So that shows that when they wanted an exception to the otherwise unlimited pardon power, they put it in. Now, maybe they never actually contemplated that a president would use it on him or herself, but I think that's really beside the point. If we're looking at what the text directs, it has an unlimited pardon power. It has one exception that doesn't apply to the president. Whether that could be, nevertheless, the, the pardon of oneself by the president could be part of a pattern leading to an obstruction of justice charge, uh, I think that's open to question. I think that's, that's not, um, not out of the question, let's put it that way. But the actual act of pardoning himself I guess I don't see why, what in the constitutional framework or text says that he can't. Go ahead, Andy. Just a couple quick points. Um, one, related to the idea of um, the president, say, let's say the president takes a bribe um, in, in return for the quid pro quo being a, a bribe, I, I'm sorry, a pardon. I would say that the exercise of the pardon could very well be effective as to the alleviation of criminal liability for the recipient of the pardon. However, I also think that the president could be guilty of Section 201 violation of bribery as an actus reus matter and as a matter of the object of his mens rea to do so. So I think that this, I, this argument that there's no that you're sort of immune from exercise of specifically granted power as president is uh, is a red herring. I think that you can engage in criminal conduct even when exercising power. And I think the impeachment power was actually actually did contemplate people using abusing specifically granted powers in certain circumstances. So that's one point. The second point is I actually think the civil criminal contempt distinction is quite important. And, and, and the reason, so I agree with Margaret on this point, the civil contempt is coercive contempt. And so if, if you're worried about the people, you know, it, Sheriff Arpaio was racially profiling, or put another way, violating the Constitution, <laughs> okay? And, and so the question is, you know, if we get into a cycle of impunity by means of pardon, what relief could those people who were suffering con continual constitutional violations under his, um, in his jurisdiction relieve? And I think the answer is he could be locked up for violating the injunction until there's corrective justice for those people. And I think, and, and the ben, here's the benefit of that. The pardon power, does, as I understand it, does not reach civil contempt. And that's also critical for Congress and its investigative power. And you know, co inherent contempt power has fallen out of favor for some good reasons in Congress. We don't have the sergeant arms carry people out of the hearing rooms like this into, the, into some detention facility for the Capitol Police like they used to as much. But we may, if we get in a situation where there's a cycle of abuse from the executive branch, there's gonna have to be self-help undertaken by the other branches in reaction to that. And I think that the civil contempt model, both inherent to judicial proceedings and inherent to congressional proceedings could become, come back into favor in, as a countermeasure to that to try and uh, change behavior. Oh. All right, and you know, to slightly uh, pivot on the discussion for a moment, you know, one thing that um, we were speaking about a mi minute ago, I know that you, you talked about, uh, Margaret, about how the use of the pardon power has changed over time. You know, one thing I think is under um, discussed when, on this topic, and we're all very interested in what the president, the current president, President Trump, might do, but President Obama <laughs> launched a program where he invited uh, people who had um, who were in prison for for low-level drug offenses nonviolent folks he had a set of criteria by which you were invited to apply for clemency he uh, originally the goal was to um, provide clemency to 10,000 people I think they reached the number of 1700 which was still fairly substantial and the goal was to reduce overpopulation in our prison system uh, we are spending billions of dollars to imprison, you know, hundreds of thousands of people for low-level drug offenses. And, and I know you're like, okay, I'm sure you're sitting out there, you're like, well, okay, well, we know Donald Trump's not going to do this, so why is this guy up here talking about it? And, and here's why. Um, because in addition to the president having a pardon power, 
governors of states have a pardon power, and most of the people who are in prison for low-level drug offenses, nonviolent offenses, people who don't have other criminal histories, who are invited to apply for the Obama uh, program, could be invited to apply to programs in the state level. And in my state, in Illinois, we have three Democrats running for governor. They're not talking about it. And I bet that some of you have Democratic governors in your state who aren't, who don't have programs like President Obama did. And there are a lot of uses of the pardon power where it can be used in a way to affect systematic change um, as opposed to just uh, on a one-off level providing justice to an individual person. And I think that you know, if we're talking about the pardon power, that is the most profound way that the pardon power can be used for good as opposed to being used for evil, which is most of, most of what we've been discussing here today. And so bouncing off of that point, uh, can, let's talk a little bit about uh, the differences uh, or not differences in the federal presidential power and power uh, and the power of governors uh, to uh, grant pardons and, and, and commutations and, and even local officials in some cases to grant this. Um, well, I'll speak to that, Ken, yes. thank you. Um, I've done um, <clears throat> in the last couple of years um, quite a bit of um, research into the way the governors have used their pardon powers, and also sort of looking at the structural setups that states have established through their constitutions uh, in every case, uh, except one, which is Connecticut. Um, don't ask me why Connecticut. Um, the legislature has always kept control of the pardon power in the state of Connecticut. Uh, but in every other state, uh, the constitution gives the power to pardon to the executive. The only states these days in which the pardon power is really working, and by working I mean producing uh, grants to ordinary people and functioning in the kind of policy way that, that you suggest it ought to, are the ones in which the Constitution um, has um, arranged to shield the pardon power from the political process, either because the pardon board is totally independent of the governor or because um, the pardon board um, limits the governor's power. Uh, I always use Delaware as my favorite example of, of a really functional pardon program. Um, and, and if you want to find out a little bit more about this, I can show you where to go. Um, but there are about 12 states in which the pardon power really works these days. But as I said, I believe it only works because of the design that the people who created the state constitutions um, uh, set up. Now, I mean, I think that's a great shame, and I am a big fan of the pardon power, as you might guess from <laughs> my many writings about it. <laughs> and I wish it were not so. Um, I think there is a, a movement these days in the states um, to move this power into the courts. Um, and I think that's a healthy move, I think institutionally. Uh, the power to uh, relieve collateral consequences, for example, and to shorten prison sentences really institutionally belongs in the courts. Um, and there are interesting law reform movements going on right now, um, and a lot of legislation in the states. Again, it's, it's, uh, it's sort of sad for me to see uh, the federal government uh, still stuck with this kind of clunky uh, uh, structural arrangement that doesn't really help the president very much. And I think the last few administrations um, have shown that the president is really not well served by having the Justice Department um, control access, be the gatekeeper to the president. And of course, what you have is the president going around it uh, when he wants to pardon someone. So. In some, I think they're, uh, they're really it's timely to talk about the situations in which there is a need for a pardon power uh, in the federal system and to decide if there is a need for a pardon power, how are we going to accomplish that? How institutionally, structurally do we want to set it up? Um, and uh, I hope that that conversation will get going. I'm personally a little bit less interested in the idea that the president might pardon himself. Mm -hmm. When people ask me that question, I say no. <laughs> the answer is no.
Um, it's never been done. No governor has ever tried it. Um, and I think that that has to be the answer, at least politically. Yeah, in terms of um, st state governors exercising it, uh, Renato and I live in a state where there's a different situation. The governor needs the exercise of the pardon power to keep them out of jail. Uh, uh, we live in Illinois, so. <laughs> So I, I want to bounce off this idea that Margaret was talking about, about uh, the system being, I think the word you use is clunky. Is there a way to change that? Are there constitutional constraints on changing the way the pardon power is implemented? So federally, you need a constitutional amendment to change where the pardon power resides. And I will tell you, it is hard enough to get people to agree on anything in Congress uh, to get you know simple bills passed. So the idea that you're going to get two thirds of both houses of Congress and 75 percent of state legislators, which I'm sure I'm a professor, the professor's looking at me. So hopefully I got the the numbers right. I remembered it from my constitutional law class uh, years ago. But that that's sort of unrealistic. And like I said, I like to be a practical uh, person when I give uh, thoughts on things. I think there is more hope on the state side. So, you know, what Margaret was talking about is potentially amending state constitutions. And I could see that happening, for example, in Illinois, where, um, you know, there was recently bipartisan agreement to override a veto. I mean, there's there can be pipe bipartisan agreement in Illinois, for example, to, to have changes. Um, so there is a potential for reform. And, and frankly, reforms in states can uh, you know, influence other states and produce change. And, you know, th I do think as Americans, we need to be thinking, you know, a lot of people talk about how do we reform our criminal justice system? And it's great to reform it in a forward looking way. But when you look at, for example, incarceration of individuals, you know, and you're looking backwards, you have to be thinking about things like pardons. If you're, what you're really concerned about is on a case by case basis, looking at people who are in prison that are costing society a lot to imprison them and really there is no value uh, for anyone in keeping them in prison. So I know uh, Renato hit on this issue a little bit earlier, but I wanna hear from our other panels about uh, the idea of prospective pardons uh, and, and the impact of that, including, uh, as Renato brought up, the ability of uh, those pardons to plead the fifth moving forward. What, what sort of implications if we start, if we see this president or other future presidents uh, doing more prospective pardons? So the first point is just prospective pardons are, per, are prospective in the sense that they pardon people for conduct they've already committed but haven't necessarily been convicted of yet. So not, it's not that you can prospectively pardon, you know, you've got to get a get out of jail free card for the rest of your life. Um, so that's one distinction right out of the gates. But I, I do think, you know, this idea of um, if, you, if you eliminate the jeopardy, in the federal jeopardy but by means of a pardon, then the person can't effectively assert the Fifth Amendment in front of Congress unless they're under investigation by the states. And so, for example, this morning, I read that the Manhattan District Attorney's Office is, is taking a serious look at Paul Manafort for money laundering. So if, if Paul Manafort received a, a pardon from the president, uh, if there were no, he were facing no jeopardy by a state, he would have a hard time making out a Fifth Amendment argument in the face of a contempt um, citation. But if he can point to that article now and say, I, ha I still face jeopardy. So, so, so that's an important um, factor here uh, as we go forward. And one thing I'll just add is that, that, that I, you're completely right about that, but for, there are aspects of the Mueller investigation that are purely federal. So obstructing a federal investigation, for example, or like reporting. So if you have like a, an improper disclosure for, of your registered stat, your status as a registered foreign, whether you registered as a foreign agent properly, some of those things don't necessarily have state counterparts. So it'll be harder in those cases. But but here, otherwise, the professor is completely right. And what about the issue of? a pardon itself rising to the level of obstruction of justice. Does anybody else want to, to chime in on that? Marty? Yeah, yeah. I've, I've heard Alan Dershowitz say that um, the president's actions within the scope of his authority under the, uh, of Article II of the Constitution cannot be deemed uh, obstruction of justice 
if they are, in fact, constitutional. And I, I find that a total non sequitur. They may well be constitutional. That doesn't mean that they can't indicate the corrupt intent needed for an obstruction of justice. The, the next issue, of course, is whether the president can be prosecuted or whether the only recourse to a finding of criminal behavior on the part of the president is impeachment. And the, the general view seems to be that the president can't be prosecuted, and I'm not sure what the constitutional basis for that is. Uh, Con congressional decisions to impeach, as, as we can see, just looking at the current Congress, can be stalled by nothing more than nakedly political kinds of considerations, and that doesn't mean that they haven't committed a crime. What if President Trump actually did what he's talked about, shoot somebody on Fifth Avenue? Um, all his supporters would still approve of him, but is the only criminal recourse uh, or uh, coercive recourse through impeachment. Uh, I'm just not sure what the constitutional basis for that widely held conclusion is. I think you'd probably have to ask Cy Vance about um, whether President Trump could shoot someone on Fifth Avenue. Uh, and I don't think that there would be much defense uh, to a state prosecution there. One other thing I'd just like to mention, I mean, I've already said I think that he could be guilty of obstruction of justice. Whether he could be prosecuted during his term is a question that I am, um, I don't have an answer for. I, I, you know, I've seen both arguments and I, I think they both have er merit as to whether or not a president can be indicted in office. I would like to just mention that I think that there could have been a constitutional violation of his oath of office um, in the sense, so if you look at the take care clause, take care that the laws be faithfully executed, that's kind of a hard thing to say that the president might have violated in the pardon context because by definition, a pardon is alleviating someone of the enforcement of the laws and it's a textual grant. So it's, it's, it's hard to make a take care clause violation argument based on the exercise of a pardon. However, I think for all the reasons uh, that Marty made in his initial comments, the president probably violated his vote, oath of office to defend the Constitution when he undermined an enforcement action designed to protect the constitutional rights of citizens. So I think oftentimes the take, take care clause and the oath act in tandem, but in this case, I think there might be some daylight between them. Again, that brings us right back to the remedy question. And I think in that case, you know, impeachment is the appropriate remedy for the constitutional violation. Um, yeah, it sounds like we're talking a lot about what will be cases of first impression if they actually do come to be, and that leads me to my next question, which is what is the role of the courts in the, uh, pre in the pardon power? Uh, will they have the ability to uh, issue limits to it? Uh, and if not, what, if at all, since the Constitution is pretty broad, what, uh, if any, checks are there on the presidential pardon power? How, who? who stands as the gatekeeper, or the watchdog on this? Um, well, let me mention one limit, um, and that is the president's power to retract or rescind a pardon. Um, that's um, an issue that came up at the end of George Bush's term. It was never really resolved because it never found its way into the courts, but it did find its way into the courts in Michigan, where Jennifer Granholm uh, had serious second thoughts about a sentence commutation that she issued uh, probably ill-advisedly without being sure that the victims of the crime had been fully uh, um, quieted, shall I say. Um, and she attempted to rescind the commutation that she had issued and the Michigan Supreme Court said not so fast. Uh, you can't do that. Um, so once a pardon has been actually granted and by granted, I mean the president has announced it. You don't have to have, in my opinion, uh, uh, a particular piece of paper. It doesn't have to be delivered in the same sense it used to have to be delivered to the warden of the prison where you galloped across muddy countryside and, yeah. and uh, tried to get it to, to, the, uh, to the prison before it, the horseman messenger could be inter intercepted. Um, but. I think in general the courts have held that there is no role for the courts in interfering with the exercise of the pardon power. Um, there is an interesting legal question right now in the case of the Arpaio pardon, 
and that is what is the um, effect of that pardon on the pending court case or on the no longer pending court case. And uh, the judge um, in uh, Sheriff Ar Arpaio's case was asked to vacate her finding of guilt. And uh, she has declined to do so. There is some precedent uh, in the DC Circuit for vacating uh, an order of guilt in one of the independent counsel cases that President Clinton granted, uh, the Schaefer case. Um, the, the judge um, uh, distinguished uh, or attempted to distinguish the Schaefer case from her own. I'm not sure it was totally um, persuasive. Um, I mean, it, it, it's it's um, straight face, I would say, but I'm not sure it will win in the Ninth Circuit. Um, in any event, it's, uh, it's a very interesting uh, question. The courts have pretty much stayed out of trying to regulate uh, the pardon power, both in the states even where a constitution sets certain limits on a governor's pardon power, they pretty much stayed out of it. Haley Barber issued a bunch of pardons uh, at the very end of his term in Mississippi. And even though he had uh, proceeded inconsistently with, with actual procedural requirements in Mississippi constitution, um, the courts said, no, no, we're not going to interfere with that. Andy? As a matter of separation of powers, I think it's important for the court to sort of retain control over their own proceeding records. So that's one point I would make. But I also think that not all pardons are created equal. And so, for example, the rationale that the president uses to pardon, grant clemency of some sort or pardon is important. So, for example, if you know, sometimes it might be because someone is just of ill health and it's, you're, it's just really a grant of mercy, but there's no question as to their guilt. That's a little, sounds a little bit like President Trump's reference to Arpaio's age, although he didn't give us a model of clarity for his rationale. Um, sometimes it's that there's serious doubts about the guilt or there's some great injustice. You know, if this were in Alabama, the Scottsboro boys, the famous, you know, um, you know, literal and figurative railroad job on these guys who were falsely accused of sexual assault. Um, and you know, received all sorts of heinous sentences, and then eventually got pardoned. Like since I've been teaching con law in the last five years, the final person that would be different. And if a court got that kind of a rationale from a, from an executive, I would want I would want the court to take very seriously an expungement of the of the records in that case. Sometimes it's for political purposes, like Gerald Ford pardoning Richard Nixon and saying. You know, and I mean that in a good sense in this case, like the country needs to move on. He took, and, and President Ford, you know, took on the water associated with that choice politically. He had to pay the consequences for making that decision and his, his poll numbers dropped. We can disagree with the decision or not, but it was the, clearly the purpose there, um, I think, was to try and help the country move on for political reasons. So I think, I think the nature and the rationale that the president has or the executive has matters for what the courts, how the courts should react. And Renato, I'm going to get to you in just one moment. I just realized that I neglected at the beginning to say we will save time at the end for your questions. Uh, we'll be doing that uh, in just a little while after uh, uh, I ask a few more questions of the panel. And uh, I just ask that you wait till the microphone that is around uh, is passed to you during that time. But be thinking of your questions now, and uh, you will get a chance pretty soon to ask them. Renato. Thanks. So I agree, you know, I agree with Margaret that courts are typically um, reluctant to get involved in um, exploring the limits of the pardon power. And I, you know, I, I think I prefaced my comments earlier by saying that I don't know exactly what courts will do, and no, you know, no one would know that in the future. One thing I just want to say is a lot of the questions that we've been asked here today or in, and have been trying to opine about today are completely unprecedented. Um, the idea that the president is going to try to pardon himself or his family or, you know, these, these crazy hypotheticals that I gave you. Um, and I, I wonder whether or not a court would get involved in a situation like that. Um, in the meantime, what I think I consider part of my role as a legal commentator, and I think part of your role as people who are informed people in the process, whether you're lawyers or not, I assume many of you are, is to make sure that the public understands how truly unprecedented actions like that would be. 
um, because in the 200 plus year history of our country, we haven't had a president try to pardon himself or try to pardon members of their family in that way as part of an ongoing investigation. So if something like that did happen, I, I have greater hope that there might potentially be involvement by the courts. Um, and if not, we would need you know, I think to make that a sort of make there be a price to pay on the political side, as the Professor Wright was mentioning a moment ago. Marty? Yeah, I, I think it's important to distinguish the role of the court in reviewing the viability of the pardon on the one hand and the role of the court in determining the legal implications of the pardon on the other hand. I think the court effectively, pl but for my suggestion of a due process clause limit in the narrow situation involved in Arpaio. Uh, the reason the court plays no role in uh, reviewing the viability or, or wisdom of the pardon is that, not that there's some special deference on the part of the court, but that the Constitution imposes no limits. It's a plenary power granted to the president, so there really can be no, no violation of the pardon power in that sense. As for the legal implications, however, in United States versus Klein in 1871, the Supreme Court held unconstitutional a congressional effort to using the limits of the exceptions clause uh, restriction on Supreme Court jurisdiction to control the court's uh, determination of the legal implications of a pardon. The court said, we get to determine what the constitutional provisions mean and Congress can't control our ability to, to do that. So whether Judge Bolton was right or wrong in this particular case, that really is a matter for the courts to decide. Um, let's talk a little bit, not just about pardons, but also commutations. I mean, Sheriff Arpaio is a high profile pardon. There have been high profile commutations, including, for example, Chelsea Manning. Uh, talk about the differences uh, and the implications between those? Sure. Um, sentence commutations are really only one aspect of, of the pardon power. Um, throughout the 19th century, uh, a lot of grants that were styled as pardons were actually sentence commutations, release, releasing someone from a prison term. Um, and gradually, um, the distinction between the, the sort of pardon for forgiveness after service of sentence on the one hand and the sentence commutation uh, began actually when I was pardon attorney, uh, when I first uh, went into that job, uh, there was a lot more sort of mixing of the caseload. Um, and it became clear that there was a whole different set of, of considerations and um, standards for um, the full pardons, the full and unconditional pardons for forgiveness, if you will, um, and the reduction of a prison sentence, uh, perhaps because it was too severe, perhaps because um, there, were, there were factors in the particular prisoner's case. It was very sick, very old, um, perhaps uh, particular influence uh, with people in power. That always happens sometimes, um, or sometimes happens. Um, but in any event, there, there, there is a definite difference. And, and of course, most people are familiar with the, um, the Obama uh, uh, effort at the end of his term, the last couple of years of his term, to um, bring relief to the uh, hundreds or perhaps thousands of people in federal prison who were serving these very long drug sentences. Um, and um, personally, I think that it could have been done quite a bit more efficiently than it was. Um, Gerald Ford considered, I think, uh, over 30,000 cases in a single year uh, through a commission process uh, where he enlisted, uh, I was told, 400 Defense Department lawyers who were all set up in offices on K Street, and they went through files like locusts. Um, and, yes. and, and I honestly think that if President Obama had chosen to staff the cases uh, in the districts, perhaps using the same sort of uh, uh, setup that it has been used in some of the large scale um, reduction of guidelines cases, or you have little teams of AUSAs and federal defenders and probation officers who just 
go through the files like locusts. Um, and if there is a will, if there is goodwill, uh, and I think there was in the U.S. Attorney's offices at the end of the Obama initiative, um, and, and in fact, uh, you know, I spoke to the, um, uh, to the person that made the last year uh, of the Obama initiative such a success, Bob Zosmer, who's really um, an extraordinary talent, who, who um, was a sort of a one-man locust, um, I think, uh, in, the, in the end. Uh, but it was very little alternative to using the U.S. Attorney's offices for, for staffing those cases. I'm sorry that Bob didn't get a chance to do his magic uh, at the beginning of the clemency initiative. I think there would have been a different result. Although, I still think a, um, a commission model would have been much more efficient and delivered justice, if you will, fairness, uh, which has never been an aim of the pardon power, incidentally, fairness, um, and, and brought relief to the many people who, in fact, are still in prison. So. Uh, Margaret, one issue that uh, you brought up to me b before this panel was uh, the issue of uh, backlogs in the system and how there are still many, many uh, petitions pouring in to, uh, for federal clemency, despite the fact that the number of actual grants has gone down in recent years. Talk a little bit about the impact of that. Wow, uh, sure. I, I, I have to say that the the Office of the Pardon Attorney very, very helpfully and very efficiently reports statistics on the number of, of applications received and, and the numbers of grants and cases closed out. And I have to say, I, I nearly fell off my chair in August of 2016 um, when I saw that um, uh, close to 1,000 new pardon applications had been filed uh, in fiscal 2016, and I thought, whoa, <laughs> what? <laughs> Come on now. You know, 300 has been sort of the standard um, in, intake uh, for the pardon attorney's office. Um, and I, I, I suppose that some of it was because uh, people seem to think, they do think, that the end of a president's term is when everything happens. Now, that is kind of not true historically. Bill Clinton sort of played into that common popular fantasy that everything happens at the end and then you have occasional state governors who also play into it, Haley Barber. Um, in Kentucky, they always save their pardons for the last month or so. Um, and uh, uh, so, so but, but still, even that, even with, even accounting for the idea that people thought there would be pardons, there have been over 450 pardons. Uh, I'm not gonna ask for confirmation from that, although I think I could get it from this someone in the room. Um, but um, they're, they're just from the published statistics, um, people seem to think, uh, this is since the beginning of the Trump administration, um, that something's gonna happen. And um, my phone is not exactly ringing off the hook with new clients, new pardon clients, but still there are people who want to apply. To me, it's the last thing I will say. To me, uh, and this is for full pardons. I'm not talking about the prisoner petitions, um, of which there are also many. Um, to me, this means that there is a need out there. It's being met in the states frequently through expungement and sealing laws. Um, and there is a real need. I'm not a big fan, at least I haven't been in the past, of expungement and sealing, but uh, I'm beginning to be won over by people who believe that, that's, that the only good criminal record is no criminal record. Um, and so I think there is a big need out there. I, I hope at some point in the future, Congress will consider um, whether dealing with the uh, tremendous burdens that a criminal record imposes on people these days uh, will be thought uh, an important thing to do. Um, it is mostly poor people, it is mostly people that otherwise don't have a, a, a lot of prospects in this life that have criminal records. But there are some who are better positioned. And of course, the, the usual reason that I get people coming to me who want to apply for a pardon is that they cannot otherwise possess a firearm. Mm -hmm. 
And that is a strange collateral consequence to be driving uh, the pardon caseload. But uh, people like to hunt in this country. And if you have cheated on your taxes or done some other uh, fairly um, uh, nonviolent thing, um, you can never go hunting again unless you get a presidential pardon. And so there are odd consequences like that. There's also the, the ability to vote. I mean, you might think that people would worry about that as well. Actually, Andy, voting is not a problem. It is not. It's not a problem, except in Florida and a couple of other states, Kentucky, Iowa, um, Virginia, not so much anymore. Um, but most states either don't take the vote away at all unless you go to prison, and then only for the time you are in prison, or they restore it at the end of your sentence. Right. So voting is not really the driver. All right, Andy. I mean, these collateral, collateral consequences of conviction are just incredibly important about how sticky the system is for people and how it's hard it is for them to, to um, sort of pay their debt and move on. But I'll also just say, I mean, the gun example, I had a client when I was in private practice, ex-NFL player, who refused to take a single count no jail time felony because he wanted to teach his son how to hunt. And so he instead spent quite a bit of time for several felonies that he got convicted on at trial. But it was like he was that was that was driving the substantive conviction at the front end during the plea negotiation. So those are those are the kinds of things you never know what your client is going to care about most. Wow. Renato. Well, one, I, one thing I was going to say on that issue, it's, it's interesting because I saw some people surprised in the, in the audience that you can't possess a firearm if you've been convicted of a federal felony. And I will tell you that that is in many ways a driver at times of U.S. attorney's offices making charging decisions. There are times when we would not consider a misdemeanor because we didn't want someone to possess a gun. And frankly, um, we could have a whole other panel about uh, gun laws uh, in the United States. But the the most um, straightforward, I always talk to, when I talk on the television or Twitter or wherever, I talk about how it's federal prosecutors are looking for narrow laws and easy to proof laws to prosecute because they have a high burden of proof. There's a, most of the gun prosecutions in this country are felon in possession of a firearm because it's so easy to prove. So. Okay, and with that, uh, if anybody has a question, we can open it up to audience questions. Um, please wait for someone to get past you a microphone. And while we wait for people to uh, think up questions, to ask our panelists, I will ask uh, this one. I was uh, struck by uh, a quote by Justice Anthony Kennedy uh, addressing the fact that there are fewer uh, federal uh, pardons than there used to be. He said, a, confident, a people confident in its laws and institutions should not be ashamed of mercy. Uh, talk a little bit about the concept of mercy and how that applies to executive clemency. Go ahead, Renato. Yeah, I mean, you know, I think somebody, I don't know if it was Professor Reddish or Margaret talked um, before about the fact that the pardon power is not about achieving justice necessarily. It's about sometimes acting contrary to what justice requires in order to have mercy. I mean, and when I was talking before about potentially, you know, encouraging governors to do what President Obama did, I don't think necessarily President Obama was making a, a judgment when he made a commutation that the, the law was necessarily, you know, um, not followed in a particular case. I think the judgment he was making was that the punishment was not um, was not achieving any end for either that individual or for society at large. And I will say that that's something that not only is part of the pardon power, but it's part of the decisions that prosecutors make all the time when deciding to bring cases. And so, you know, people, you know, have asked a lot of times, well, why are these types of cases prosecuted or other types? There's broad discretion that prosecutors have, and as a prosecutor, many times I had to play a part in decisions to whether or not to charge individuals with crimes, and I think that the concept of mercy um, and and looking beyond just the circumstances of a case does have a role um, both in prosecuting and in pardoning. Uh, if, if I could, um, Justice Kennedy's statement, like many of his statements in Supreme Court decisions, uh, is, is rather vague and not moored to, to some 
some intellectual grounding. I mean, if you, if you just take it as a blanket statement, it proves too much. By that reasoning, then anybody who's convicted, you should show mercy to. Or alternatively, if they're convicted and they committed the crime, why do they deserve mercy? So there have to be some kind of articulation of principled guidelines to determine why mercy should be granted in one case and, and not in another. So I, he's really just restating the question in his statement. I mean, that, the heavy lifting is, is to come once you, once you accept the broad contours of what Justice Kennedy said. Um, let me just add to that, that um, I think pardons are kind of like the canary in the coal mine, if you will. Um, the health of the system, of the legal system, uh, depends upon there not being a great need for pardon. Um, back in the 19th century, we had a pretty crude legal system, and we needed pardon like crazy. Um, it's not clear to me that uh, some aspects of the federal system do not these days um, rise to that level. But the, the cure is not for, to have more pardons, um, but rather to fix the legal system. Um, and uh, that's hard work, but, um, and you know, in the, in the interim, uh, it may well be that there's an important role for pardon, um, and, and again, I don't think Justice Kennedy did. That was an ABA speech that that, that comment was made in uh, in 2003, uh, and it was a very influential speech. And I, but I would correct Justice Kennedy if I might, or I would suggest to Justice Kennedy that the that the uh, the proper word was really not ashamed, uh, but afraid. And that's been the problem, I think, with using the pardon power. Um, but again, um, my own feeling about it is that uh, we should be working very hard to change the legal system uh, so that there is not as great a need for pardon. Hello, uh, my name is Dustin Hansen. I'm from uh, Senator Cortez Maslow's office. And uh, I'm not a lawyer, and so I was uh, curious as to um, the pardons, do they absolve somebody from a particular crime, or is it their entire involvement in, a, in like an incident? Like, does it have to specifically designate what it is they're being pardoned for, or is it their involvement on everything related to that, whatever the crime is? Erica? Um, sure. Um, ordinarily, the pardon is for a conviction. And what is uh, the direction of the pardon are the consequences of conviction, whether it be a prison term that is being shortened or whether in the more general sense of a full pardon, um, you are uh, relieving um, the uh, legal consequences, the legal penalties, um, the collateral consequences uh, of the conviction. In the federal system, uh, a pardon has uh, always been understood to relieve those mandatory legal consequences in federal law, certainly probably in state as well. It is, has also been seen as a kind of a sign of good character so that um, it, it also would address the less formal legal consequences where you're simply discriminating against someone uh, because of a criminal record. Um, but, but it does go typically to a conviction. Over here. Uh, Sam Berger Cap. Could you talk a little bit about the notion that a, a pardon or accepting of a pardon involves uh, acknowledgement of guilt, which I know has been put forward at least in one case, but seems uh, somewhat challenging given the, the wide range of, of cases in which pardons can be used? Or just your thoughts on that. Oh, Go ahead. We can Go ahead, there is, as you noted, there is a, a pretty well known Supreme Court case about how. The pardon implies uh, an admission of guilt, the acceptance of a pardon. There have been cases that have cited that case for that purpose, so I would say that it is good law, quote unquote. But I don't think, I mean, people are drawing large conclusions from that, like, 
okay, if you accept a pardon, then that is sort of a, an, an admission that can be used against you in a legal proceeding. I actually think that the, the, the circumstances of that, that case are such that I'm not sure that it would be it, it, it's, it, I think drawing it to the circumstances that people are trying to draw to today is questionable. But more importantly, just speaking now as a, for, as a trial lawyer former and a person who's tried a lot of criminal cases, I don't think that that quote admission unquote, even if it, even if it was such, would not be admissible in a criminal case anyway, which is what I think a lot of people are asking about. Like, hey, you know, so if this person accepted it, can that be used against somebody in some court proceeding? And the answer is uh, almost certainly not. Um, it would be highly prejudicial, and, and there'd be a number of other reasons. And I'd just add to that very briefly that there are pardons for innocence. Uh, there are not that many, but there are some. Uh, and um, I mean, I could, if, if someone asked me, I could argue uh, that, for example, the Iran-Contra pardons that, that President George H.W. Bush issued were really pardons for innocence. Uh, I could even make an argument that President Trump's pardon of Sheriff Joe was a pardon for innocence, um, not with a, a very happy look on my face, but, mm -hmm. but, um, but, but no, I mean, you can say that. Uh, and if it is for innocence, then accepting it is, is certainly not an admission of guilt. Yeah, in the Klein case that I mentioned before, a uh, post-Civil War case in 1871, uh, the, the court rejected the notion that acceptance of a, of a presidential pardon by a Confederate was an admission of guilt, uh, but rather constituted actually proof of loyalty so they could get their property back under federal legislation. So the Klein decision may well have been superseded on that point but it really took the opposite perspective. It took the perspective that um, the, the pardon actually wa removed any guilt that might have, might have existed before then. Just one other side point. I mean, you know, for the folks who aren't claiming innocence, part of the sort of DOJ process is acceptance of responsibility. So that, so to the extent that it's going through that process and there was a finding through the sort of pardon process DOJ regs, then that, you know, it does sort of have that flavor to it. But I think there are really actual innocence claims where we're correcting justice with a pardon or some, you know, and that's, that should be, there should be room for that. And, and I'll just add that those statements would be admissible, potentially be admissible, although there would be issues of whether it would be unfairly prejudicial in a criminal proceeding. But, um, you know, that's another point to be made about the Arpaio, the Arpaio pardon is that it, that those procedures were not followed, and Mr. Arpaio did not file an application, and someone like Margaret uh, did not take a look at that and make any kind of consideration. That's an assumption. That okay. I'm, <laughs> I'm digging that from press reports. So no, I don't no, know. No, that's no. For of course. Uh, and and just for the record, I did not. Um, yeah. But um, uh, it's true that if you are going to file an application for a pardon, um, you better not go in there uh, claiming that it wasn't your fault or that somebody else made you do it. Um, and uh, sometimes uh, my clients are uh, kind of um, have lingering uh, resentments. Uh, about the ordeal that they would put were put through by the Justice Department, and my comments to them are, wait a minute, look, you're going right back there, and uh, your application's gonna ultimately, uh, if it has any chance of success, gonna be sent to the U.S. Attorney's Office for comment, uh, and uh, you better um, uh, contemplate that when you're describing whatever it is that you did. Another question? Hi, my name's Paul Quincy. I'm with Senator Klobuchar's office. Um, there have been reports that Special Counsel Mueller has been working with the uh, Attorney General of New York in prosecuting Manafort and looking into some of his dealings. To what extent can DOJ participation with state governments frustrate the purpose of the pardon uh, power, and is there precedent for them doing that intentionally? So um, we talked about limits in the pardon power earlier. It's a fantastic question, by the way. Um, and, you know, the professor mentioned one of them, which is impeachment. Another one is that the president can only pardon federal offenses. So um, that's one where the, the constitutional text, I think, 
um, you know, sets a pretty pretty uh, firm limit. So in terms of prosecution of state offenses, uh, I don't think the president will have any ability to do that. And I don't think that the participation of the federal government in those state investigations would change that at all. And in fact, what I would say is in my nine plus years as a federal prosecutor, um, I often worked with state officials, uh, and there were often circumstances where we would have joint federal state efforts, and I would be passing evidence to the state prosecutors, and that they would, so we'd have some people I would prosecute, some people that they would prosecute. Sometimes we'd announce it on the same day together, uh, and there are established procedures in the United States Attorney's Manual, which is essentially a guidepost for um, federal you know, guidebook, you know, guidebook for federal prosecutors in terms of how to pass grand jury information in a proper way from federal to state authorities. So I would, I would regard that as routine. Um, it's just what's not routine is we're investigating individuals associated with the president of the United States as opposed to drug kingpins or street gangs or whatever the ordinary context might be in which that is uh, usually done. Yeah, I can see no constitutional problem with that either. Just one other add point, which is, you know, one of the things since looming in the background here is the mass incarceration discussion that, that's been having, we, we've been having as a country. Um, you know, the, one of the th effects of, of very severe federal penalties for drug crimes is not just the people that end up in the federal detention. Uh, it's people in states who get leveraged by that, by the state prosecutors who say, don't, you know, I can always s send it over down the street to the U.S. Attorney's Office and you'll get triple the time. And then they say, yeah, I'll plead. So it's, I think it's very common that there's this sort of interplay of, you know, I don't know if we want to call it cooperative federalism in this case, but, you know, these sort of joint state federal task forces and other sort of, you know, in Savannah, Georgia right now, feds are picking up all the gun warrant cases because we've had a lot of gang violence recently and so there's been a lot of sort of sweet street sweep types of stuff by the federal government that's trying to supplement Savannah Georgia police for to deal with the violence problem so I think it's pretty common any other questions well, if you would all please join me and thank, oh, no, we have one more, sorry. <laughs> sorry about that. No, it's okay. Um, thank you to the panel. My name is Jenny Katzman. I'm with the American Constitution Society. Um, my question is, given the current climate and what we know about how this administration may execute its clemency powers, what advice would you give to people in the pardon attorney's office or in DOJ at large on how to do their jobs and execute their duties? It's a great question. Why don't we just go down the panel? Start with Marty. Uh, I'd tell them to go into academia. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's an easy life. Okay, uh, I would not tell them that. Um, I would tell them just to keep doing their job as best they can. Um, I've always thought that, uh, however, a good part of the pardon attorney's job ought to be looking for ways to keep business away from the, the office, so I would, in addition to processing cases as best I could, um, I, I would also uh, be kind of looking around um, for some institutional support for reducing the caseload. For example, the United States Sentencing Commission has been very interested in a statute uh, that is, in fact, controlled by the Justice Department um, that authorizes bringing cases back to court in, in cases usually uh, of old age and sickness, but it's certainly not limited to those two, two criteria. So I would think, oh, this is one area that I could shed some business here uh, and um, that, that I ought to be looking around to, for allies. Um, I ought to be looking around uh, to congressional staffs interested in uh, expungements or set-asides or sealing, that kind of thing. Um, I would also want to engage, perhaps, uh, those interested in hunting um, to see if there couldn't be some way to shed some of that business from the pardon attorney. It's ridiculous that the president is a one-man gun licensing bureau. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, that's nuts. Um, and it used to be that this authority was in ATF, and they sort of... Uh, abused their authority uh, in Congress's eyes, but there's no reason it should not be 
there, there should not be some administrative restoration procedure to enable people at least to use long guns and at least to be vetted in terms of their likelihood of violence. And there's not, I mean, there are some federal um, people with federal convictions that, that have uh, violence in their background, but there are many, many that do not. So, so that's one thing I would be trying to do would be to find other channels for the business. I mean, honestly, uh, I get asked a lot of times, you know, by actually by young people, should I consider applying for federal jobs or for, consider being part of um, the ju Justice Department? And my answer is generally yes, because I think we need the more the more good people we have in those jobs, the better. And I think that whether you're in the office of the pardon attorney or anywhere else in the Justice Department, I think that you can do a lot of good. I was one of those locusts that Margaret talked about earlier on, on certain, uh, for certain things in the past, and I've handled, you know, I was also a commentator or, or a evaluator at the U.S. Attorney's Office of certain pardon petitions, and I think that, you know, you can play a valuable role, and, the, the, you know, as long as you have integrity and are doing your duty, you know, so, so you know, the, the decisions that are made at a higher level are, are what they are. You don't think it matters who's running the Justice Department at the time? You know, I think that it's a great question. And what I'd say to, I've actually had somebody ask me for advice this week about whether or not they should apply to work at the Justice Department and or whether they should work at a U.S. Attorney's Office. And my answer is it does matter at a high level in terms of priorities, for sure. It matters for high-profile cases, for sure. Um, but there is a lot of work that is done by the Justice Department massive amount of work that doesn't change that much from administration to administration. And I would rather have someone with integrity looking at those cases. I made a lot of decisions about cases that none of you will ever read about. I mean, I, you know, the, there are certain cases of mine that people have read about and commented on and discussed. There are a lot of cases where they haven't in which I impacted people's lives. And the decision I made maybe to have Maybe Justice Kennedy would call it mercy. Maybe somebody else would call it something else. In a particular case, it had an impact on someone, and I think that you know a, a person working at the Justice Department can have can add value there uh, if they have integrity. Andy, I agree with um, with Renato's comments. I would just throw in I think which component of the Justice Department matters too. If you're doing like immigration right now, maybe you you know it might matter. Um, um, it, but if you're in antitrust, maybe not. Um, I would, I, let me just step back since you've gotten very pardon specific good answers from um, other panelists and just say, we really need lawyers right now and, the, and, not, and, and citizens you know, engaged in lawyer-like thinking that aren't, that aren't necessarily lawyers because you care about facts and you care about principles, right? Facts and law. And those are things that we need to be able to try and figure out, like how do you ascertain what a, a rule of neutral you know, applicability is? And these kinds of things about how do we actually know something in the real world, whether it's fake or not. So I think there's, it's really important to have good lawyers who you know, meet their ethical obligations and, and in our Justice Department and are doing their best to execute their oath of office to defend the Constitution of the United States and to enforce laws. And I think we need to really, we could benefit from that aspect of the lawyer profile right now in society. Okay, any other questions? Well, if you could, please join me in thanking our panelists today.